New consoles are a very exciting time for the video game industry. A new system has the potential to completely redefine what a game series could be like. There's a lot of anticipation to see what this new hardware might allow for. This was especially a huge deal during the N64 and PlayStation era. At that time, games could now go fully 3D, and while the graphics haven't aged too gracefully, that was still a huge deal at the time. There was so much potential for video games to take a direction that they really hadn't seen before. However, some series didn't quite immediately go the 3D direction. Series that lived primarily on handheld systems stayed in 2D for a significant while longer. In some cases, even for decades after their console counterparts had completely abandoned making 2D games. However, not all things can last forever and a franchise might eventually feel the pull of the third dimension. An obvious example of that would be Pokemon X and Y, released in 2013 for the Nintendo 3DS. 2013, Jesus. But if we're gonna talk about Pokemon X and Y, this setup doesn't seem to be the greatest for a video like that. So let's make a few changes, shall we? Oh yeah, I can't snap, so, um, boom! We're in an airport now, and, uh, maybe this isn't the best outfit to wear when out on a vacation like this, so let's change that too. All right, let's go. This game was a huge first for the series. This was the first main series Pokemon game to be fully in 3D. This is not the first 3D Pokemon RPG, however. That distinction goes to Pokemon Coliseum back on the GameCube. But this does so happen to be the first fully traditional Pokemon adventure in the third dimension. This in turn presented a lot of challenges for the dev team as it represented a total shift of how the series was presented. Even though technology has improved dramatically from the days of Red and Blue, 3D games still take more effort to make than 2D games. So, in order to achieve the transition to 3D, a massive staffing increase was going to be necessary. According to a 2000 Nintendo Power interview with Junichi Masuda, Gold and Silver were developed with a staff of about 20 or so people. Meanwhile, of the more recent games, Black and White was developed with a team of about 70 employees. X and Y, however, had an even larger team. Masuda stated in an interview with Nintendo Life, we have a much larger group of people working on the games this time around. On the actual development of the game, we have about 200 people working on X and Y. And then, with the global simultaneous release of the titles, we have more localization staff and other people to make that possible. I think in the credits, there's about 500 names that appear. And even outside of those people, there are some involved in the development of the game in some way. Think about that for a second. Even at the most conservative estimate of the size of the team, this is a tripling compared to the last game. And the most liberal one makes it a seven-fold increase in the staffing. That is an insane increase in personnel. So we have to answer the question, what were these hundreds of extra people doing? Well, a huge chunk of them were working on modeling the nearly 700 Pokemon that existed at the time. This was subcontracted to Creatures Inc., a company that works very closely with Nintendo and the Pokemon company. And this was not completely well received by the team initially. Ken Sugimori, the lead artist for the series, was a bit skeptical of this idea. If you think about it, it was really a madman's idea. It meant basically throwing away all of our 2D skills. On the other hand, however, Takedo Uno, the lead graphics designer for the series since Ruby and Sapphire, thought it was completely doable. This is kind of tooting our own horn, but with Pokemon Black and White, I think we succeeded in getting the pixel art to animate in a more attractive fashion. With that experience in mind, I decided to go ahead with 3D modeling, with the understanding from the team that if we aren't satisfied with the results, will quit at that point. So with the help of creatures, I think we produced results that even the fans will like a lot. Make a note of that last sentence. We're going to come back to that in a little bit. He also discussed why the team held off on making the jump for so long. Going 3D for them had been in the back of our minds for a while, but we also all agreed that we didn't want to go 3D if we'd wind up losing Sugimori's artistic touch on the Pokemon in the process. So we stuck with pixel art for a while. But as time went on, I think we naturally started to think that it was time, in terms of our 3D skills and in terms of being able to use the 3D screen as well. Worth noting here is that this is not Creature's first foray into 3D modeling. Previously, they did all of the Pokemon modeling for both stadium games, Snap, Hey You Pikachu, Coliseum, XD, Battle Revolution, 
as well as Smash 64 and Melee. They also later went on to develop the Poke Park games, as well as the Pokedex 3D apps and the Pokemon Dream Radar. So in a sense, this is literally their job. The difference here is that of scale. Not only were more Pokemon needed than any of those other previous projects, but they also had to build an entire game on top of it. This was an absolutely insane undertaking, and it had to be done in less time than previous games. According to Masada, this game only took three and a half years of development, whereas Red and Blue and Gold and Silver were each developed in about six years each. Now, to be fair, both projects did sort of almost crash and burn, but three and a half years and 700 Pokemon is still a huge ask. So in the end, did this gambit by Game Freak pay off? In many respects, yeah, it did. The game sold 16.58 million units, making it the number two best-selling 3DS game of all time, just behind Mario Kart 7, which sold almost 19 million. This is also in line with how previous initial pairs in the generation have sold. Critically, these games were also extremely well received, boasting generally favorable review scores. The gaming magazine Famitsu had awarded the games a near perfect score, netting them a platinum award from the publication. The only Pokemon game to ever do better than that was Black and White, which got a perfect score. And beyond that, in terms of this game's legacy, for better or worse, this is the vehicle that threw the series into 3D. The models that were developed for that game are actually still in use today in basically every project, including mobile apps like Pokemon Go. That being said, however, I think that this is quite easily the weakest of the mainline games on the 3DS, if not the entire franchise. There is quite a bit of stuff to like here. There's also so many things that are just underrealized and in some cases are just downright poorly done. So I thought, let's start off the discussion here about the game's presentation in the most fitting location, an art museum. Presentation and art style are in many ways X and Y's strong suit. The opening sequence with the professor is an incredibly strong start. The game uses the 3D camera to great effect here. You can really see what the 3DS is truly capable of right from the start of the game with these fantastic full-sized models. We're then treated to the best opening to the player character's bedroom ever. Take a look. It, it just attacks him for like, why? <laughs> like, this is absolutely incredible. But before we go any further, I do need to talk about the models. So for some reason, this generation decided to use a chibi art style for character models in the overworld instead of keeping the fully proportioned models that we saw in the introduction, only using them in battle and specific cutscenes. It's not a bad art style per se, but it's just a bit of a jarring shift to go from this incredible opening cutscene and then realize most of the game actually looks like this. However, I do sort of get what they were going for though. This sort of represents maybe the most natural evolution for the series visually. It gives the game a look that is still somewhat reminiscent to previous titles. Familiar, yet pushing the series forward at the same time. Other decisions made in the game's presentation also show this approach. One such example is the dark outlines on all of the Pokemon and characters. Uno explains why this decision was made. Right at the very end, we begged the programmers to add light or dark thickness to the outlines around each 3D model, so they'll look closer to the 2D illustrations. I think that had a really huge effect on the results. Before that fix, the 3D models looked a lot more robotic, but I think now they're much more like Pokemon. Again, they're trying to not completely change everything overnight. On top of that, there's a tiny bit of utility to utilizing this approach. The outlines help everything stand out a little bit more, which is especially helpful on a system like the 3DS, which has a fairly small screen. Smash for 3DS actually utilized a similar approach for that game, for the same purposes. Beyond that, the existence of Sugimori's art style 
is not completely absent either, as these games decided to, presumably to save on development resources, use 2D portraits for most enemy trainers, including on some of the more important ones, like gym leaders and Elite Four. This is a bit of a cool concept, but it does sort of cheat us out of seeing the gym leaders in full 3D, which is kind of part of the point of this, I feel? No? Okay, okay, we'll move on. And while again, this art style is very strong, it suffers from some major technical limitations. The biggest is that the game disables the 3D for a decent chunk of the game. The only place that it's ever even used is in battle. And even then, that is only in single battles. In fact, Generation 7 isn't playable in 3D at all. It is only in Generation 6 that this is ever done. And to be completely fair, the 3D is the most underutilized feature on the 3DS but it's still indicative of some potential optimization issues. And in fact, it turns out that that is actually the case. The Pokemon models were actually developed with extremely high polygon counts for the system that they're being developed for. And while this is great for the idea of future-proofing and not having to recreate the models every generation, it does create some issues of potentially pushing the somewhat underpowered 3DS past its technical limits. In a single battle with a 3D off, you generally won't have any problems, but once you start to add more models that the system needs to render, you start to run into an issue. This means mechanics like triple and rotation battles, which were just introduced a generation ago, are scaled back dramatically and then went on to be retired after this generation. The other major issue with the future-proofing of these models comes from something called Sky Battles. I'll talk about the specifics of that a little bit later, but the broader point here is that it took a ton of Pokemon that were never flying in their art style or previous 3D models and forced them to be perpetually flying just for this one mechanic. And it's something that we still see to this day in Pokemon like Swellow, Zatu and Skarmory, just to name a few. In terms of a development standpoint though, this was in all likelihood the right move to make. In game development and software development more broadly, the more things you can reuse for other applications, the better. But there can be serious issues if you're scoping stuff outside of the current hardware that you're developing for. Overall, however, these technical issues aren't super prevalent and the game runs fairly smooth most of the time. The footage I'm displaying might not show that, but that has more to do with the way I was recording the footage, as the method I use has a bad tendency to drop frames. Rest assured though, the game does run mostly well. So I got a little bit bored of the art museum setting. I'm not the biggest art guy to begin with, so I decided let's just go outside and enjoy the streets of Paris while we talk about the next aspect that I want to discuss the region. This game introduces us to the Kalos region, which, if you haven't already guessed, is heavily influenced by the nation of France. The game really shows it too, with things like small amounts of French being included in the English script, to some more subtle things like the introduction of the tourist trainer class. Furthermore, the central hub city of Lumios is quite clearly inspired by Paris, down to the wheel and spoke pattern that it uses for its design. In fairness, the real life version of this does not surround the Eiffel Tower, but the inspiration is still quite clearly there. Another, maybe more strange feature of this region is tipping. As far as I can tell, this mechanic doesn't do anything. There were a ton of theories back in the day as to what it did, say for example, it increasing your odds of finding a shiny Pokemon, but it turns out that none of those seem to be correct. However, what makes this inclusion such an odd choice for the region is that tipping isn't that big of a thing in France. It is, for the large part, a distinctly American phenomenon. The understanding in America is that for certain services that you receive, you have to tip. Up to the point where it's literally in the law there that servers can get paid significantly below the minimum wage in many locations. In France, however, the 15% that is the standard tip in America is already built into the price that you pay with your bill. And on top of that, the servers there are compensated quite well and in many cases receive benefits from their employers. And like, tipping is still a thing there, like who's gonna turn down a tip from someone? But it's not as ingrained in the culture as it is, say, in America. Which is what makes it even more strange that it never shows up in any of the American-inspired regions throughout the series only in this one. And since Paris is considered to be the fashion capital of the world by many, this game makes for the logical place to introduce a much requested mechanic, character customization. This is something that was honestly not really possible before the series had gone 3D. Technically, again, this wasn't the first game to do it. 
that was Battle Revolution. This, however, represents the first mainline RPG to have this system. And while it is a pretty cool and much needed addition, this version is a little bit limited. For starters, you have to wear a hat at all times for some godforsaken reason. However, beyond that, you have a little bit more than just fashion to express your character. At the beginning, you can select your character's skin tone out of one of three options, ranging from super pale to kinda dark. Beyond that, you can also change your character's hair at the salon, which introduces the classic video game knowledge of getting a haircut can somehow make your hair longer. You can also dye your hair a number of different colors, although in this game, they're pretty much all natural hair colors. There's gonna be no crazy anime hair here. Lastly, you're able to use special colored contacts to change your character's eye color, which is definitely a bit of a creative way to solve the issue. I personally have actually used them before. Never for any natural eye colors, but I've definitely used it for some more unnatural eye looks before in previous videos. And while we're sort of on this topic, just as a general PSA, costume contacts, can be quite dangerous. If you live in the United States, contacts are classified as a medical device, which require a prescription in order for you to get them. And that is for quite good reason. Your eyes are one of the most fragile structures in your entire body. In order to safely use costume contacts and contacts more generally, you need them to be able to fit properly in your eye. So the best way to make sure that you're using them safely is to get them through an eye doctor. They will walk you through everything that you need to know, how to put them in, take them out, and how to store and clean them properly so that your eyes stay safe. Back to trainer customization, one of the biggest and more perpetual gripes I have with this system is the lack of male options for customization. For starters, there are less hairstyle options for males, which sort of makes sense, because you have to wear the hats, but still. But on top of that, there are double the number of clothing items for female characters. Which is kind of annoying because I like to be able to style my character after myself and be a reflection of me. And I have literally less ways to do that than my female counterparts. That being said though, Game Freak seems to have done away with this inequity by going the same route as Animal Crossing and Splatoon by just simply removing the gendered customization options altogether. Back to Gen 6 though, one of the more contentious points was a statement that implied that this might have been a one-off thing for the franchise. Masada used the France setting to justify not having character customization in Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire. In terms of the customization of the trainer, that was really kind of a special thing for the Kalos region, which featured this kind of motif of France and really focused on this beauty and fashion aspect, which is why it was a prominent feature in that game. Obviously, they did reverse course in future games, but in the case of Gen 6, it was very clear that the devs saw this as something being thematically tied to the Kalos region. And while we're on the topic of the player character, something that's interesting about this game is that these protagonists seem to be quite a bit older than what we're used to. That was technically something that started in the previous generation, but it does continue here. In terms of their counterparts, in the anime, Serena is about the same age as Ash, which is 10. As for the manga counterparts of the two characters, they are age 12. However, in the game, their age is never directly stated, but there are a few pieces in the game that do hint at their age. Most of this comes through a character named Emma in the post-game quest. The first thing that we know is that she is younger than the player character. The second thing we know is her exact age. She is stated to be 16, which would put our protagonists at a minimum around 17 or 18. Meaning, these could be some of the only Pokemon characters who are legally adults, which makes so much more sense. I would be much more comfortable sending an 18 year old out into the world on an adventure than I would a 10 year old. Moving from the characters of the region though, onto the Pokemon themselves, we also see some of the France inspiration take hold. As per Sugimori, with the game taking place in a Europe-inspired setting, he told us to avoid coming up with concepts straight out of our own minds, but to fully examine source material and such before putting pen to paper. We did things like visit France in order to get the full atmosphere of the area into the game. I wish my job sent me places like that. I would love to go to Paris for the sake of work. That seems like a great time. Uno gave a bit of an example as to how this particular method was applied. 
It was easier in some ways to pin down Pokemon designs once we settled on a region. For example, you see wild hares all over the place in the mountains of Europe. So that's what led to the rabbit influence Bunnelby. I mean, it was to the point where you'd see rabbit holes butt right up against the road once you went out in the country. However, when you look at the legendary Pokemon, they may be a bit of a strange choice as the inspiration here is clearly Nordic, which on first glance, yeah, you might question that because the Nordic countries are up here and France is down here. So what exactly gives? Well, this is likely a reference to the Norman Vikings who settled in France and did quite a few important things, like say, invading England. Honestly, as a whole, the designs for this generation are all so stellar. Part of this seems to be from the decision to reduce the number of new Pokemon that were introduced. This game only introduced 72 new Pokemon. This partly was to give the art team more time to remodel the existing Pokemon, but this also ended up reducing the amount of bloat in the roster, thus giving us better designs as a result. So, so far I've been saying mostly positive things about the Kalos region, but that's not the whole story here. There's a lot to like here, but in other ways it feels just so underutilized. In terms of the route and town design, nothing here is too standout. Most stuff is still mostly on par with what we saw in previous Pokemon games. The game is quite linear, however. There are only a small handful of optional routes, and the north of Lumio City is blocked for nearly half the game by these random NPCs who, for some reason, say there's a power outage, but, like, you can clearly see the lights on behind them, so I don't know what they're talking about. There are also a lot of things in the game that are teased that then don't really get followed through on, like these doors on Route 13. They look like additional entrances to the power plant, but they never end up doing anything. Not even for an event of some type. There are also a quite a few one-room caves throughout the region, such as the Chamber of Emptiness, which has literally nothing in it besides a few items. So it's basically the Scorch Slab of Gen 6, which is funny because Oras actually expanded the Scorch Slab. Beyond that though, there are virtually no post-game areas beyond just the one obligatory town where we place this game's version of the Battle Tower. So in all respects, once you beat the champion, you've basically seen the entire region already. However, the worst victim of myth's potential is the legendary Pokemon Zygarde. And in all fairness, this one is not entirely the fault of the development team. This is a bit more of an issue of X and Y never getting that third version that expands the story, which honestly explains a lot about this game. The fundamental flaw with the third version model, besides the somewhat questionable business ethics, is the fact that if that third game never comes, then you're left with a ton of stuff that was never explained in that generation. Honestly, that's part of what makes X and Y so weak to begin with. Could you imagine how Gen 4 would be perceived if Platinum didn't exist? Would all the people who love it and say it's the peak of the franchise say the same thing if they only had Diamond and Pearl to go off of? I think not. So overall, the Kalos region has so much potential and a fantastic aesthetic that just doesn't get acted on and we are left with all these things that feel somewhat incomplete. So I decided to move settings again. We are now in the Palace of Versailles, which Honestly, looks very pretty, but there's a bit of a darker side that you might not be aware of. The basic gist of it is that the place was basically a giant health hazard back in the days of the monarchy. There was one room where they stored all of their dirty clothes and apparently it smelled extremely bad. This was also in the times before modern plumbing, so people would sort of just, uh, you know, in the hallways and it would make the place really unsanitary. Oh boy, I really hope I keep my monetization after saying that. Isn't history fun? Likewise, while the presentation of Kalos is pretty nice, as we've already sort of covered, there's a few issues with it, which extends into the gameplay as well. All right, so first things first, let's get the obvious out of the way. It's a Pokemon game. The gameplay hasn't changed that much since 1996. It's the same basic loop as pretty much every mainline game that came before it. That, however, hasn't stopped Game Freak from making a few tweaks to the formula. While in this generation, the overworld exploration is still grid-based, you're now allowed to move diagonally. On top of that, the game gives you something a little unique that takes advantage of its new technology, the roller skates. This item never appears in the franchise again, but it makes it so that when you use the circle pad to move instead of the D-pad, not only do you move faster, but you have a full 360 radius of control, 
allowing you to go off the grid and move however much you want. You can also do some cool tricks with them if you talk to the right NPCs. And while it's annoying that the grid is still being used in a lot of places, this just goes to show that the series is doing something to take advantage of the new hardware that it's being developed on. This game also serves as the introduction to a somewhat recurring mechanic throughout the series, Ride Pokemon. This iteration is quite a bit limited though, only showing up in a few routes and not really being able to be taken out of those routes too easily. However, this still sets up the potential for Ride Pokemon to come in in future games, which as we all know, they did. In terms of returning mechanics, HMs are still back here, but have been scaled back quite massively compared to other games. There are only five in the entire game, and most aren't even required. They just provide access to goodies and the ability to create shortcuts in certain areas. The only one that's ever really required to navigate the region is Surf, which is a completely fine requirement because Surf is a good move and Water is literally the most common Pokemon type. Moving outside of overworld features though, there are a few big new additions to the game, namely Pokemon Ami and Super Training. Pokemon Ami, allows you to play with the Pokemon that you have in your party, taking full advantage of the 3D models as well as the touchscreen to allow you to pet them. There are also various mini games that you can play that award you with treats that you can use to feed your Pokemon. In terms of how the system works, while you'd think it would raise friendship, it doesn't. Instead, it affects a new stat called affection which can only be increased here in this generation. Raising a Pokemon's affection grants various buffs in battle, most of which are completely overpowered, which is why I never used it throughout my playthrough. So as you can tell, this mode is completely optional and can be avoided if you so desire. The only requirement to ever use it is that it's necessary to evolve Eevee to Sylveon in this game. Honestly, these features are only a problem in games like Let's Go and Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl, when affection was merged into the friendship mechanic and the effects would automatically be added as you played through the game. Super Training, on the other hand, is a fantastic system and adds so much quality of life to the game. It allows you to EV train a Pokemon completely without battling. No need for special training items or spreading Pokerus around. You just play these mini games and get EVs. It also makes resetting a Pokemon's EVs a total breeze which allows you to use your in-game party for competitive if you so desire. On its own, this would represent the biggest breakthrough in making competitive more accessible to more players, if not for the introduction of a little something called Horde Battles. These are 1v5 wild Pokemon battles that are only present in this generation. Pokemon you encounter are much lower leveled normally to make up for the fact that you're at quite a disadvantage in these fights. But if you wanna make quick work of these encounters, Multi-hit moves are a godsend. It allows you to take all of them out in one go. However, what makes these a little bit more than just a gimmick is that they allow you to EV train extremely fast. Most hordes are all the same Pokemon, which makes farming for a particular stat extremely easy. Also, the changes to the experience share, something I'll touch on a little bit later, gives EVs to the entire party when it's turned on, meaning that you can train up to six Pokemon at the same time. And while super training does require less knowledge than horde battles in terms of the inner workings of the EV system and what Pokemons give out what EVs, horde battles are still considerably faster when you know what you're doing. The game also introduces two other battle modes known as Sky Battles and Inverse Battles. Sky Battles are a special format that restrict which Pokemon can participate, allowing you to only use flying Pokemon and those with the Levitate ability. A further restriction is that if a Pokemon has Levitate as one of two possible abilities, then you must have that ability in order to use that Pokemon. You're not gonna be using any heat-proof bronzongs here. There is, however, a small list of some Pokemon that, based on the criteria I've already outlined, could participate, but aren't because they don't fly in their animation. This is what I was referring to when I said a lot of the models were ruined by this mechanic. To be eligible, you had to be visibly flying. And so, beyond just a few base stage flying types, most flying Pokemon are now forced to fly in their animations. Beyond Pokemon, there are also some moves that are banned because they make no sense to use, when there's no ground beneath. Like, for example, pretty much every ground type move. But then again, ground moves are kind of useless in this format to begin with. It's a bit of a cool concept, but it's also kind of annoying to actually partake in them. It essentially forces you to raise flying type Pokemon as well as Pokemon with the levitate ability, even in cases where that might not necessarily make sense for your team. And if you're someone who typically doesn't duplicate types in your team, 
then you might get stuck in a 1v3 situation with some of the NPCs. Overall, this is kind of a cool thing, but at the same time, I think the damage to some Pokemon's animations just wasn't worth it. Inverse battles, on the other hand, are criminally underutilized. These are battles, as the names might suggest, invert all type matchups forcing you to completely change your thinking when it comes to battling. These are only accessible through a single NPC, that being this guy, Inver. And he's no pushover. His teams are quite well put together. The biggest change in this format is that Pokemon have no immunities here. The only way to have an immunity is to have an ability. The system also makes it so that most Pokemon are weak to their own type. Overall, this really could have been an interesting battle mechanic if it was used more. It would have really upped the difficulty in a lot of places when you have random trainers who battle you who challenge you to an inverse battle. Overall, I think this option is much better than Sky Battles and I wish this was the thing they focused on instead of those. However, when it comes to big changes to the combat system, no change is bigger than that of the introduction of Mega Evolution. This was a meta-defining mechanic. Essentially, it allowed a Pokemon to give up its hold item in order to have a massive increase in stats, and in many cases, new abilities, and sometimes even new typings. This in turn, gave the way for devs to improve certain Pokemon that weren't that good to begin with without giving it a completely new evolution, effectively allowing for three-stage Pokemon to get even stronger. There were so many Pokemon who benefited from this too. There were ones who in previous generations were more or less worthless, who then found a space in the competitive scene for the first time Ever. That being said though, there was a bit of an issue with the Pokemon they selected to Mega Evolve. A lot of the Pokemon that ended up receiving Megas were already good to begin with. Gengar, Lucario, Gyarados, Scizor are already top tier Pokemon. They didn't need to be made even better. Which is why, during Generation 6, Smogon banned a fair number of Megas. Despite that though, I feel like the good outweighs the bad, and this mechanic really should be brought back in future games because a lot of Pokemon have sort of suffered competitively from its removal. This game also makes a few changes to the type chart, the first time since Generation 2 that this has ever been done. The first and arguably more minor of these changes is that Steel type Pokemon no longer resist Dark and Ghost type attacks. This decision was likely to counterbalance the type which is noticeably very defensive and hard to damage with most Pokemon. Plus, resisting Ghost never really made that much logical sense, but then again, does anything about this series make logical sense? The other reason as to why this change was made has to do with the much more notable change that this generation introduced. That being the introduction of the 18th Pokemon type, Fairy type. Okay, yeah, it is not the light type that a lot of people were hoping for, but it's pretty close. The first and arguably most notable thing about this type is what the reveal trailer seemed to focus on. Which is super effective against dragon type Pokemon. Adding a new twist to your battle strategies. So for context, dragon was kind of an overpowered type, especially in Generation 5 competitive. And when I say overpowered, I mean it was to the point that Masada literally admitted it. Dragon type was so strong, it was difficult no matter how we tinkered with it. Wouldn't change, and it would have been sad to make the dragon type weaker. So apparently their solution was to just add a new type. And similar to what was done to Magnemite and Magneton in Generation 2, several existing Pokemon from previous generations gained this new type. In fact, Several Pokemon that were previously normal type lost their normal typing to gain the fairy type. This ended up giving a lot of new potential to old Pokemon. Clefable and Azumarill are two examples that are now competitive mainstays. Clefable, for example, jumped all the way from Smogon's rarely used tier to its overused tier, where it has stayed ever since. This game also saw the introduction of a new evolution. Sylveon, which is also the only Pokemon introduced in this generation to evolve from a Pokemon that already existed. It also winds up being one of, if not the best evolution by a considerable margin. My heart still lies with Glaceon, even though I know it's terrible, and I can just never use it in a single player because it's always available way too late in the game. Beyond just the potential that this type has on its own, it also brought much more use to two previously underutilized types, that being Steel and Poison. These two types are the 
only types that are super effective against fairy types, which is going to give more use to types that previously were only super effective against other types that had a ton of other weaknesses. These were not types that I regularly used during playthroughs. On my first playthrough of X and Y, I struggled with fighting fairy types because I didn't know exactly what the matchup was, and I never really used steel or poison type Pokemon on my team as mainstays. So it made them seem kind of overpowered to me. But now I've sort of just gotten used to it and I know what to do with them. But it is still now a mainstay of the series. And I often end up running a fairy type on my team in the newer games. Another fairly major balancing change was the changes to the weather mechanics. Namely, weather inducing abilities which now no longer summon permanent weather. This was likely due to the rather insane weather wars that were prominent in the previous generation's competitive scene. This change seemed to have had the inverse effect that the fairy type did on several Pokemon. Politoed, which was previously in the OU tier, dropped to what Smogon now considers untiered, where it has also remained ever since. This didn't last too terribly long because Oras decided to make new permanent weather abilities and then allowed them in VGC one year. Either way though, this definitely nerfed those weather abilities quite a bit. The last major change to competitive Pokemon was the introduction of these little blue pentagons on a Pokemon status screen. These are what are referred to as origin marks. As the name implies, they signify the game that the Pokemon originated from. So in this game, all Pokemon caught or hatched in generation six had this mark on them. However, any Pokemon transferred from generations three through five had no mark. This is something that has continued in subsequent generations, with the Switch games each having their own distinct mark, as well as games like Pokemon Go and the virtual console releases of generations one and two having their own marks as well. So what's the significance of these marks? Well, the people at Game Freak and the Pokemon Company decided to make these marks a requirement to use them on a team in official tournaments. This in effect prevents you from transferring the same team forward from generation to generation. You have to bring a new one in every time. And now, on to the biggest sticking point with this game. The most contentious change to the game's mechanics comes in the changes to the experience share item. This game decided to take that item and change it from a hold item to a key item that when turned on, gives half experience to all Pokemon who didn't participate in battle. Now, to cut through all of the massive amounts of anger that this mechanic brings on, in isolation, this is not a problem, provided the game was balanced around it. So, is that the case here? Absolutely not. In no way was it balanced. I'm not gonna go too deep into the specifics as to how the experience system works, but I am gonna show a few formulas on the screen. So in generation four, the amount of experience you got from battle was a flat calculation based on mostly two factors, the level of the defeated Pokemon and its species. There were a few other multipliers in there, but that's the main thing you wanna focus on. Generation five took that and altered the formula quite a bit to factor in the level of the Pokemon that was receiving experience as well, which means you would gain more experience for defeating a higher level Pokemon and less if you defeated a lower level Pokemon. Gen six decided, however, to revert back to the formula used in the first four generations with a few additional multipliers tacked on. However, another change in gen five that was not reverted was that the experience yield of pretty much every Pokemon was increased to counterbalance the changes to the calculation. So thus, the amount of experience you were getting was now just completely higher in general. And that's not just it. The other issue comes from this particular term in all of the formulas, one over S. Traditionally, this was used to split experience between all Pokemon who had battled. In those games, if you used two Pokemon to fight, they would get half experience each. Gen 6 changed this so that all Pokemon who participate in battle get full experience. So this term is only used when you have the experience here turned on to award half experience to the rest of your party. This further increases the amount of experience you get from battles, even when you're not using the experience share. To give players even more experience, because God knows they didn't have enough already, catching Pokemon now awards experience. And again, none of these are necessarily bad changes. The problem is that the game doesn't account for any of this when it creates its level curve. So you can quite easily wind up being super over leveled depending on how you play the game. And sure, you can somewhat mitigate this by turning the experience share off, but the game gives it to you 
enabled, you're actively encouraged to use it. So if you're going to have a system like this in the game, it needs to be reasonably balanced. My way of getting around this was instead of turning experience share off, I would simply rotate around my party throughout the game. By the end, I was using like 12 to 14 different Pokemon in rotation. In practice, this approach is a little annoying because it predates being able to access your PC from the menu, but it's still something that you can only really do in this generation. And while it's cool to use double, in some cases almost triple the number of Pokemon you normally would, especially with the size of the Kalos decks, the game really should have just been balanced more. Like, what were they thinking here with this system? Did anyone playtest this? because it sure doesn't seem like it at times. It really doesn't. There's a few other changes that these games made that are a little bit noteworthy though, mostly on the multiplayer side. This game introduces something called the Player Search System, or PSS. This is more or less the extension of the C gear from the previous generation. This system moves all multiplayer components out of the Pokemon Center and onto the bottom screen of the 3DS. I don't have any real footage to show of this because my recording setup blocks all wireless comms, but either way, take my word for it when I say that this makes trading and battling so much more convenient. You can basically do it from anywhere. This game also introduces something called Pokemiles, which is a special currency that can be traded for items or sent to the now defunct Pokemon Global Link to be traded for an even wider array of items. These are gained in a couple of ways. One is by just normally walking around through the game. Another is by trading and battling with different players. And the last one, is through Street Pass. Street Pass is a bit of a dated mechanic now. 3DS users are gonna be far less likely to carry around their systems these days. And on top of that, there are some other challenges. Street Pass in general only really works in more densely populated areas that have a lot of public transit that people use. It's great for a city like say, Tokyo, but if you live in America, it is statistically likely that you get around primarily by car. It's a shame, but as it currently stands, that is the reality of things, which makes the ability to use Street Pass quite a bit limited. The other quasi-multiplayer feature that I wanna highlight is the Friend Safari. This is a sorta kinda replacement to the Safari Zone after it was removed in Gen 5. It's a system that only appears in this particular game. The first thing to note is that it is not a traditional Safari Zone. You still use your party and your inventory to catch the Pokemon here. What makes this unique is that it consists of several types of safaris that contain three random Pokemon that can be captured. Any player who has the game will always start with one to represent themselves. And then the rest are determined by the friend list that you have registered on your 3DS system. And this is not limited to just friends who have X and Y. Literally any friend, even if they don't play X and Y, will have a friend safari. Just having them on your friend list is enough. The game will basically take their friend code and use that to assign them a type and three different Pokemon that will appear. So beyond just sort of a cool system, what reasons might you have to use it? The first is that it has several exclusive Pokemon that can only be obtained here outside of trading and transferring from previous generations. It also guarantees that the Pokemon that you find there have at least two perfect IVs, which makes it easier to raise a good competitive team. The only real problem with it is that you need to have friends registered in your system, which can be a challenge if you have no friends or friends who don't own a 3DS. That all being said, however, this was still a fairly unique way to emphasize the idea of friendship in the series, and especially in this game when that is kind of one of the core themes of the story. So yeah. And since I've already talked about some of the changes to the competitive scene and how super training has made it easier to EV train Pokemon, what about the other aspect of getting a perfect Pokemon? The IVs. Well, in this case, getting good IVs is now significantly easier due to changes made in this generation. The first of these changes is that the Destiny Not Hold item, an item that previously wasn't all that useful, can now be used to pass on five random IVs from either of the parents. This theoretically makes breeding for a Pokemon with five perfect IVs, which is the most you'll ever realistically need, much easier. On top of that, any Pokemon that can't breed, like for example, legendaries, are guaranteed to have at least three perfect 31 IVs, making getting Pokemon like those easy as well. Honestly, these changes help a lot. I actually ended up writing a paper for it in my high school math class applying statistical methods that I'd learned to figure out 
how much easier it might make it. Unfortunately, I seem to have lost the file for it, so I'm not quite sure if I'll be able to share it with you guys. If I do manage to find it, I will put a little card on the bottom of the screen and link it in the description. But if neither of those are there, assume I don't have it. Either way, I thought it was a pretty solid paper. And actually, this paper was written during the tail end of Generation 6 and uses X and Y and the Friend Safari as an example. Either way though, this game was the start of making competitive Pokemon accessible. Each generation since this one has introduced something to make it easier to get a full competitive team without going through all the tedious effort. And honestly, I think that that is a net positive for the series and the best thing that modern Pokemon has going for it. Overall, the gameplay is not completely atrocious. There's just some kind of glaring balance issues and a few other systems that I think had some unintended negative consequences that we're still dealing with today. All right, so we're gonna be doing a little bit of time travel for this next section. So here we are in Notre Dame before it burned down. So this place has a ton of history to it. And yet at one point it fell into such a state of disrepair that people wanted to demolish it. However, there were a few that wanted to preserve it. One such man was author Victor Hugo, who wrote an entire book in an effort to save the cathedral from being torn down. That book, of course, was The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Yes, the same one that inspired the Disney movie. One of the things that's really funny about that book is that Hugo was so focused on emphasizing the beauty of the cathedral in such an effort to keep it from getting knocked down that he spent two entire chapters describing it. As you'll see, long stories with questionable pacing are sort of a French pastime. Hugo is also the same guy who wrote Les Miserables, which you might know is the thing that got turned into a nearly three hour musical that still manages to cut a bunch of stuff out of his nearly 2000 page book. Either way, French literature does have a pretty long and storied history. So how does the story of X and Y stack up against such great works of literature? It doesn't. It really doesn't. And while Pokemon isn't known for its storytelling, I don't think there's any Pokemon game that I would compare to such classic works of literature. This story in particular is one that is quite unnoteworthy. If that little intro tangent wasn't a bit of an indication, a problem with this story is its pacing. The game's pacing is completely off. The most egregious example of this is the massive gap between the first and second gym, which is fine to have, but the problem is that then you basically clip through all of the next few gyms in fairly quick succession. On top of that, this game has so many characters and gives them virtually no focus at all. The rivals in this game are a particularly egregious example. While many people might be quick to say the problem with these rivals is that they're not jerks and we need more rivals like Blue and Silver, I'd be hesitant to say that that is the issue with these rivals. The fact that they're friendly to the player is not the issue here. If you want a good example of how that works, the previous generation did a great job at giving us non-antagonistic rivals by simply giving them actual character arcs something that uh, some other rivals like Blue don't quite have. Like Blue, these rivals are kind of static, but without the more outwardly antagonistic aspect that make people like Blue. Beyond that, a major issue is that there are just too many of them. Tierno and Trevor do close to nothing for most of the game. Shauna gets a little bit more with the stuff in Parfum Palace, but even then, she's a little bit ignored in favor of only one rival, that being either Serena or Kalen, depending on who you're playing as. And even then, she just isn't that interesting as a game character. I know a lot of people like her in the anime. I've never seen the X and Y anime, so I can't say necessarily if that's correct. But yeah, no, she's just not that interesting here. So that's one half of what makes a Pokemon game iconic. The other one is the evil team, who are just as bland and uninteresting. So for a lot of the game, their goals aren't really clear. They come across initially as just another money-grubbing organization, sort of like Team Rocket. And then they do this total 180 after the seventh gym, where they reveal that their plan is to take something that wasn't mentioned all that much before called the ultimate weapon and wipe out all life except for them. What? That is such a shift in tone. These guys were goofballs for a decent chunk of the game. What? Also, their secret leader, Lysander, is such an obvious giveaway that he's the leader of Team Flair. Like, bro, you're not fooling anyone with the way you have them dressed. As a character, he's introduced alongside the movie star Diantha, who is the champion in this game. 
also known as the most uninteresting champion. You walk into them having this brief discussion as to whether or not Diantha, who would want to stay young and beautiful forever, to which she says that she'd rather age like everyone else and take on different roles as time progresses. A response to which Lysander doesn't quite seem to be completely on board with. So. What's his deal? Well, Lysander's primary motivation is to preserve beauty in the world, and claims that conflict between people erodes that. So the solution is to reduce the human population. This plan, oh boy, this plan. There's so much to talk about this plan. So beyond the reference that a lot of you are probably reaching for with this plan, the person who I want to mention is someone by the name of Thomas Malthus. Thomas Malthus was an English cleric and scholar who wrote a paper known as an essay on the principle of population. He wrote, population when unchecked increases in a geometrical ratio. Subsistence increases only in an arithmetical ratio. A slight acquaintance with numbers will shew the immensity of the first power in comparison of the second. So for those of you who speak English, that's a fancy way of saying that population growth would quickly outgrow resource production by a considerable factor. The most important takeaway from that though is that he was wrong. The first is that he way overestimated the rate at which the population would grow. Modern population growths have slowed down quite considerably, both in the US as well as globally. The other issue is that he wrote before the Industrial Revolution, so he didn't quite account for how rapidly technology and productive capacity would evolve in such a short span of time. In fact, contrary to Malthus's claims that food production would be the problem, the bigger issue, as it seems to be, is waste. According to the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, one third of all food is wasted, which as it turns out, is about enough to feed two billion people, more than double the known number of malnourished people in the world. I'm not here to say what any particular solution is to this issue, just that overpopulation isn't so much the problem. It's more a matter of logistics. We don't need a giant weapon to kill a bunch of people. Either way, the issue isn't that this game touches on the idea of Malthusianism, is more so that it doesn't do a whole lot to set it up and then just sort of lets it happen. From there, you just go on to beat the last gym, fight the Elite Four, and then Diantha, the world's least interesting and weakest champion. And then it's basically over. Except there's one last fight with this guy, AZ. Initially, he seems like this just random, super tall guy, but it turns out that he is supposed to be the king of Kalos who built the ultimate weapon. As he explains, it was actually built to bring back a Pokemon that perished during a war before being converted to a weapon in order to exact his revenge for losing the Pokemon to begin with. This, of course, causes the Pokemon to leave him and then forces him to wander the world alone for 3,000 years as the weapon also made him immortal. His arc is resolved right after that battle, which is fairly quick and easy, in which his Pokemon is finally returned to him. And then the story is over. And that's the last we ever see that Pokemon. There's files in the game's data for this particular form of Floet, but as you might suspect, it was never released. The biggest issue here is that the plotline has some potential to be good, but just isn't well executed on a lot of fronts. There's so many interesting ideas that this game could have explored had it taken the appropriate time. Beyond the main story, the post game isn't all that much either. There's like maybe an hour of missions involving Looker and this random girl called Emma who he takes in. You sort of see this bond grow between them and a bit of his anguish as he wrestles with the fact that he's not quite being truthful as to who he is and that his job will eventually take him away from her. Event which, as you might expect, eventually does happen and you get this whole emotional goodbye scene as he reveals that he bought the building where his office was located and allows Emma to keep it and basically live there and do whatever she wants with it. Sorry you have to go away like this and that I sort of lied to you about who I was and what I was doing here. Anyways, here's a mortgage. Hope you can pay it. Overall though, this bit is actually one of the better parts of the story. It's just so short that there's barely a post game at all. Beyond that, there's a few other things that you can do. There are a few legendary Pokemon you can catch. There's Zygarde, there's a Mewtwo, and there's also one of the legendary birds depending on your starter. So again, there's a lot of potential in this region. They just could have done more with it. So I decided to end our little discussion here in Paris Sorbonne University, the oldest university in France, in order to talk about the topic of legacy. 
So France as a nation has a very rich history, but also quite a few issues that you might know about. On one hand, it's full of beautiful art and is the birthplace of many well-respected thinkers, but it's also kind of known for a considerable amount of political instability and conflict. Similarly, Generation 6 is both historic and looks pretty good for a handheld game, but is also very, very rough around the edges. Sure, it did bring the series into 3D, but in doing so, some of the 3D models don't look super amazing. Some just seem kind of lifeless, and others, as I mentioned, are permanently changed by a one-off style of battle that never appears again. Some people might argue that the series should have stayed 2D, but I just don't think that would have happened realistically. X and Y going 3D was a big deal. At some point, there was simply going to be too much external pressure for Game Freak to ignore it. On top of that, you have the fact that Nintendo was selling the 3DS partly off the fact that the system had this no glasses 3D. Had X and Y been 2D, there would have been complaints about how the series was stagnant by refusing to go 3D. And before some people mention it, the whole HD 2D art style was not really a thing at that time. That really started with Octopath Traveler in 2018. Might the series have been better to adopt that art style? Maybe but I don't think we'll ever be able to say for sure. But at this point, what I can definitely say is that there's not really gonna be much benefit from reverting. At this point, we're almost a decade out from X and Y's reveal. The series has simply changed too much to really go back now. On top of that, all the new mechanics that have been introduced don't really work in a 2D game as well. So the series is gonna probably have to stay 3D for the foreseeable future. Moving back to X and Y though, the game also introduced a ton of new mechanics, including ones that are pretty well liked. But on the other hand, the game is marred by a few technical issues and some extremely broken game balance. And while technical issues definitely still plague the series today, some of the more egregious balance issues have been addressed, at least in cases where you don't use the exact trainer and encounter tables for a game with a completely different experience system. You know, there's no way that would have caused any problems whatsoever. On the whole though, some people would like to say that Pokemon is on the decline and that this game was the start of it. But I'd like to say that that's maybe not entirely accurate. The series has had a fair number of ups and downs since 2013. X and Y, Sword and Shield, and BDSP are just some extremely low lows. What we seem to be seeing from the series is that the first Pokemon game on a new system is generally the weakest one, and then everything that typically follows it tends to improve upon the experience in some manner. For example, Diamond and Pearl are very weak games in isolation. The engine is extremely slow, and there's just a lot of things that the game should have had, which is why Platinum and Heart Soul Silver fixed some of the issues with the amount of content, but even then they couldn't quite shake the Generation 4 engine. But then Generation 5 comes around and completely redoes everything, dramatically increasing the speed and bringing us the generation that is basically considered the best the series has to offer. Similarly, X and Y has a lot of issues and Oras in many ways is a better experience than those games, but still quite can't shake the stain of the Generation 6 engine. And then, as you might expect, Generation 7 came along and addressed some of those issues, providing a better experience than what had come before it, which is something that definitely can be its own video, by the way. The Switch, on the other hand, is a bit weird because Let's Go is better in a lot of ways compared to both Sword and Shield and BDSP. And obviously, Legends is kind of just amazing. Like there could be fixes with the graphics and some of the gameplay elements, but overall Legends is very strong. Overall, my takeaway is this. Even though the series has hit a lot of rough patches, X and Y in many ways laid the groundwork that allows for games like Legends and Scarlet and Violet to exist in the first place. These games stumbled, but in the process unlocked the potential for so much more from this franchise. And I'm hoping that in the years to come, Game Freak starts to realize that potential more and more. And with that, I will see you guys next time. Everyone in the Kalos region is shocked by the news of the last week. So today, 
I'd like to share a moment with Lysander from a different time. Pokemon trainers, listen well. The future isn't decided. You can't be sure each day will be like the one before. You have the potential to change the world. Help build a brighter tomorrow. Adieu.